I'm now recording. It's amazing. Okay. So uh, again, we uh, we are recording. So uh, stop your video if you don't want your uh, um, happy COVID face to uh, be preserved for posterity. Uh, we have a, a pretty full meeting. Uh, so I'd like to get started fairly quickly. We're going to be starting with um, a talk by Paul Taylor about a uh, a trip that he and his wife made, which I've uh, seen some advanced uh, looks at it, uh, looks at it, and it looks uh, very cute. Uh, we're get, then going to follow up with a discussion by uh, Gary Crawford about a an astrophotography project that he's had, um, and the much anticipated and uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing the results of the astrophotography pro uh, contest that we had. It, we had a, a lot of submissions. I think there were 53 uh, in the end. And uh, so we're going to be presenting the uh, winners tonight. We'll also obviously be uh, looking at some of the pictures. Uh, I think probably after that, I haven't figured out where the uh, where the break will be. But at some point, um, we'll have a, a some sort of bio break in the middle. Um, then Ron McNaughton will give a discussion about some interesting sort of life uh, possibilities on, uh, well, I'm pretty sure there's life on Earth, but possibility of life on Mars. And um, uh, Krishna uh, Videla has uh, written some uh, astronomy logbook software that uh, was mentioned on a, a few postings to the group. Uh, and uh, we'll be discussing that. And if we have time, I will then be giving a very brief rundown on the Telescope Loan Program and what we've been up to and uh, uh, that sort of idea. So I will, I will now... Have you been looking at my face all this time, you poor people? Um, so th that's our... Uh, lineup and I apologize I thought I had had that screen up but again I got lost uh, so I'm going to now open up um, the screen to oh I apologize I have to admit some more users I don't know how Randy does this I certainly don't do it very well I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to open it up to Paul Taylor, if I can find him. So there you go, the Paul. If you... Yeah, the screen sharing should be on now, Paul. Tell me yes. It is, it is indeed. Uh, but let's just... See what we've got. Um, I'm going to move this over. We got your whole desktop. There we go. I need to move that and slideshow. So last February, my wife and I um, were coming back from Ecuador and the Galapagos, and we stopped off in Florida. And when you stop off in Florida, you really uh, have to stop at the Kennedy Space Center. So we started looking for things to do and we found the astronaut training experience. And there's the details. It's expensive, $175 US. It's about uh, three, four or five hours. You get a t-shirt, you get a nice lanyard with your name on it. You get snacks, you get a certificate saying you've taken astronaut training. Um, and in our case, we got a photo of Mississauga, an area taken from the ISS. They very quickly um, split us into teams. Uh, my team got to have blue t-shirts and gray hair. The other team got to have blue t-shirts and regular hair. Um, kidding aside, it's sort of pointed out the universal appeal of space exploration. You had people literally from teenagers to octogenarians and everybody there for the same purpose that, you know, they thought that this was going to be a really neat experience. And we started off, there's uh, several areas and 
Um, some of them, like in the microgravity area, there are four stations in the um, lunar or the Mars lander, there's two stations. Some other ones, there's only one, but it's, it's very, very well put together. And in the microgravity section, you can see that there's a, what looks like a, a backyard uh, chaise lounge the, um, with the NASA logo on the side. It's actually supported by a cushion of air and it's meant to replicate how it would feel if you were in zero or very, very low gravity environment. Um, if you think of the air hockey games, that's a, sort of the same principle. And so one of the guides um, comes out and talks to you about uh, what your experience is going to be like. And these are the tools of the trade. You can see in the box, there's a number of items. These three are items that you're going to swap out as part of your task. Um, the other items are the actual tools that you're going to use. Everything was done in teams. Um, ours logically was myself and my wife as one team, um, but it very much stressed the aspect of, you know, working as a team when you're working in space. And what I propose to do is I'm going to show you a number of still photographs of what we did in the astronaut training area. And then um, I'm going to hopefully show you a small promotional video, three, four minutes, showing you how things actually worked out in practice. So there's me. Um, you can see the caption, float like a butterfly, curse like a sailor. You're floating on this cushion of air and you find out very, very quickly as you move up and down that gantry that if you don't have a sense of finesse, if you try and muscle it, you're gonna start sliding all over the place. And so, you know, there's me um, laying, it, laying down on a, on a uh, supine position uh, with the love of my life talking into my ear, telling me what to do. And you can see on the gantry, there's various positions, 36, 48, 60, 72. And what I found really interesting was that you were working with your hands above your uh, body the, the whole time. It was a bit of an unnatural, way to be working, but you'd be required to, uh, for example, take one of the little boxes off and then replace it or to go onto the other side of the gantry and unplug all the, uh, the lines and then plug them back in. Um, and it, was, it, it did give you some feeling of how um, an astronaut in a zero gravity environment uh, would be working out. And this is the um, lander rover. Uh, they had two simulators, this one and the one beside it. Um, and you go through this mesh door, you end up inside. You can see in this area, that's your console. Um, it works like a video game. You've got some uh, controllers and joysticks. You sit side by side. And then you go on to walking on the surface of Mars. Um, this was a new experience for both my wife and I. We hadn't done any virtual reality games before. And so you get fitted with the virtual reality goggles. Um, you're given a couple of paddles. And in the virtual reality, you actually see what the surface of Mars would look like. And you're given various tasks to go and pick things up and put them in various boxes and then take the box and put the box on the, the rover and things of that nature. And all of them are timed. And of course, they tell you that nobody has successfully completed all the four tasks. So right away, sort of subtly, um, there's a bit of pressure on you to perform. And both in the um, uh, microgravity simulator and on this one, uh, the lander, you have somebody uh, and the lander and in this one, the uh, virtual reality on the surface of Mars, you have somebody uh, talking in your ear constantly. Um, now, 
um, one of the great lines of our experience was um, my wife allowed that um, she was so much more effective in giving instructions to me than I was to her, which will tell you volumes about the success of our 50 year marriage. Um, this was a fascinating um, part of the tour. You could click on any area of the um, International Space Station and it would show you exactly what was happening at any given time. And so, you know, being Canadians, we both asked, well, you know, where was Chris Hatfield sitting on the ISS when he was playing his guitar and singing to Canadians and stuff like that? And immediately they could zero in on the cupola where he was um, sitting, which I, you know, I found fascinating. And I mean, I thought that this would be sort of a way station, just a time, uh, waster time killer maybe, but it was it was a pretty fascinating um, exhibition. This is the area where they showed us what you'd have when you went off into space and you can see sort of the freeze dried food here and the backpack and uh, a variety of other things. And then it became very interesting in the next area. Um, when the astronauts do their extra vehicular activity, uh, they're out for extended periods of time. And of course, they have to wear a diaper. And if the liquid that might emanate from them hits the diaper, the gel immediately congeals. And this young man had filled this beaker with water and it immediately became this gel. Now, it's interesting to see the reaction of my co-participants. This guy looked like he'd been there, seen that, done that. This guy was just looking forward to the future as to what his life might entail. Now we went off to the actual launch um, and you can see in the background, there's the, the vehicle. Um, I was a bit disgruntled at this one. I mean, I, I didn't get to be the commander. I didn't get to be the pilot. Um, I, um, I got to be the dishwasher, but the joke was on them because when I was in my youth, I was a professional dishwasher, so I, I aced that part of the uh, uh, program. And what you do is everybody has, I'm kidding aside, everybody has their own particular roles and the pilot and the commander and the people in charge of docking. And they actually uh, simulate the docking of that spacecraft uh, with another vehicle. And it's sort of similar to what you see um, on television programs and things of that nature of the, the docking. Now, I'm gonna step back just for a minute and then see if we can um, show you um, a little video of what actually happened. Oh, we'll go. environment. You sit in one of those covered chairs. I'm going to move it along to. Is that coming up, Ellen? Center, we're scheduled to open in February. We're going to go drive right. on Mars first. Just got out of the simulator and somebody was here directing us what to do and now we're going to direct them what to do on this screen. So right now they're driving on the surface of Mars. Look, you can see them going over bumps and mountains and everything going to experience microgravity. You can kind of see what's happening right there. We've got this camera set up to capture me experiencing it. And what they do is they set you in this chair and then you're on a bed of air and they give you tasks. Somebody's talking to you through a microphone for teamwork and you come in and you have to move different switches, unplug different plugs and do all kinds of other stuff. Thank you. 
This guy's gonna have an astronaut helping him out. We need safety. This is John McBride, the most interesting thing I've ever seen. An astronaut who's actually been in space trying to teach somebody who's never been in space how to control themselves as if they were in space. As far as the microgravity environment goes, this is what the controller sees here. And this person is giving the person that is in the little hover chair over here directions on what to do. They have a camera on their helmet so they can see what they're doing. Next, I'm gonna go walk on Mars using this VR headset. This is what I was seeing when I was in there. And this is that shot, Sam Durant's using VR and getting to visit Mars. This is the teammate that is giving the person with the VR headset on directions on where to go. Here's astronaut Bob Springer doing some exploring virtually on Mars. Now we're going to go into the other side of the building, which is Mars Base. I find it reassuring that even astronauts look sort of dorky when they're using VR, as I've always felt very self-conscious. Just before I go to the next area, I mean, it's very interesting because they were at great pains to say that how many of the astronauts found it was totally realistic and everything of that nature. And by the way, for those of you who are paying attention, that was not Joe Van and Duel in the chair. It's a TV reporter from South Florida. <laughs> So my thoughts um, exactly. We'll just go back to the slideshow. Um, I said right at the beginning that one of the Avengers was expensive, the other one was not expensive, and both were very enjoyable. This is the Sands Space History Center. It's a little museum on the Cape. Um, it's named after General Sands, who was one of the um, early pioneers in the space program. And um, we found an absolutely marvelous story. You know, you always find like the hidden gems when you're traveling. It's free. Uh, the, 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 the people that were um, staffing it were knowledgeable, enthusiastic. They've all lived on the Cape. They've experienced stuff. I mean, it was really poignant. At one point, um, the woman that was showing us around started talking about Apollo 1, and you could see tears welling up in her eyes, you know, and uh, was really quite amazing. Um, it has a great little gift shop with books and all sorts of memorabilia. If you want to get a patch from Apollo 4, 6, 12, whatever, um, they're there. And there's their um, uh, address, email, or, uh, and, what they've done is they've taken sort of each launch site and put a little uh, display board. And it was, you know, we sort of forget that, you know, early on in the 50s, uh, this was all military. I mean, what they were interested in there was, can we get a rocket to put a nuclear warhead on? Um, and some of them were tactical, you know, sending them off the back of trucks. Some of them were supposed to be ICBM um, and they just, as I said, would have each launch site had its own display board. Um, they had what they call a boilerplate mercury capsule. And, and I mean, I think we've probably all seen these, but it needs to be re reinforced just how small that capsule was. Um, you know, if you were over five foot nine in height, you were out of the astronaut program, you were too tall, you couldn't fit into the boilerplate uh, capsule, and that was uh, sort of the end of you. They had all kinds of interesting stuff. This is uh, a Titan second stage rocket engine that would separate, you know, the first from the second stage. 
this was an Atlas rocket engine, and you can see, you know, it would be at um, uh, launch site number 11, 12. Um, this I found fascinating, um, you know, a rotary dial telephone. And this was actually the console uh, that would abort any mission, that would blow them up in, in space. Um, you know, the beginning, the, uh, the Mercury program. And remember, you know, the monkeys going off in space. And, you know, if you think back, those of us that are old enough to think about the start of that program, you know, very, very rigorous debate about whether you put men, and it was at that time men, uh, into space, uh, as opposed to using robots and things of that nature. And don't forget that that continued right up to Apollo 11. You know, the Russians had launched Luna a few days before, and if Luna had been able to get to the moon, grab some samples, turn around and come back before Apollo 11 had landed, it would have created another firestorm of argument that, you know, we don't need to put man on the moon. We can send a rocket with a robot and it can pick stuff up. They point out that, you know, the Cape is still active. And what's really interesting, because as you drive into the Sands Museum, you pass Richard Branson's uh, operation and the other half of the building where the Sands Museum is, is at SpaceX. And I've seen stand-ups by the public relations people from SpaceX and you can see them standing right in front of the, uh, the building. And they had a great sense of humor. This is their trophy for the Gemini program. And you remember that the Gemini program um, had some problems sort of right at the beginning, which they survived. And you'll notice I'm very definitely pronouncing it Gemini because apparently there was a debate whether it was Gemini or Gemini and the astronauts decided that it was going to be Gemini, contrary to all linguists. Now, some bonus coverage. Um, these two ships. Do you know what they are? Let's get this out of the way. And we will just skip through this ad. So, um, you know, that's, that's the presentation. Um, the last little bit I found fascinating. Many of you probably, like we did, watched 60 Minutes last Sunday, and they had a discussion between a former NASA administrator and the present NASA administrator about the Artemis program. And the former administrator was saying, why are we building rockets when we can buy them off the shelf from Elon Musk and reuse them? And the present NASA administrator says, no, 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 no. We have to build them ourselves. 
And the interesting thing is that, you know, when in the United States where socialism is the dirtiest of the dirty words, you find out that of the 48 continental states, every single one of them has a component being built into the rocket, which has gone from, I believe, $4 billion in cost to $20 billion in cost, and they're all one-offs. So that was our um, excellent Florida adventure. So I don't know if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Paul. That was that was great. I I, I think it's uh, I don't know about catching the fairings. I gather there are about six million dollars or something, so it's worthwhile than better than dumping them in the ocean. But uh, landing those uh, boosters back is pretty astounding. <laughs> well, and it, it points out how much technology has progressed. I mean, admittedly, the fairings are suborbital and they're easier to track. But they're they're catching it, whereas we all remember, um, and it's a bit of a, uh, an apples and oranges. But they were sort of lucky if they got the Mercury capsules within forty five miles <laughs> yes. of, yeah. of the landing zone. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm. Oh, someone someone's uh, suggest Kirby suggesting that. Uh, He's going to do the uh, astronaut training next time he's down at the Cape. That, that that did look very cool. In fact, I'm thinking about getting one for my back backyard so I can float around. Well, and as I said, uh, when we get back together again, I will bring my certificate and uh, <laughs> wear my T-shirt and show you the picture of Toronto and Mississauga. <laughs> All right. Well, you should look at the uh, look at the chats. People are uh, thanking you very much. That that was uh, that was very nice, Paul. Um, I'd ask I'd ask uh, Gary now to um, share his screen so that we can he can even turn on his audio. I'm not here in audio. Is anyone else? There we are. That's because there we are. I just turned it on. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully you've got uh, all systems that go here. Yeah. Yeah. I see see your screen and I hear you. Perfect. Uh, we hope. I um, yeah. oh, really appreciate the chance to chat and uh, share some of my the fun I've been having this winter with you and uh, and uh, not 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 over too long a period of time, but. Um, so this is kind of marks the end of my first year venturing into this uh, venturing into this hobby, and uh, I I looked over my notes and I shot this subject through the Rosette Nebula last year around this time. I have a date of about March twentieth on a on a very very poor photograph, but that photo I don't want to even show it to you, but that photograph is is really so, something that um, triggered my desire to, to do even more with it because uh, there's I'll, I'll share with you something that that came 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 to mind as I was looking at this uh, for the first time but and many of you have I mean this is one of the most popular winter subjects to photograph and and I imagine many of you have shot it and perhaps have experienced the same kind of feelings when you when you went through this but um but at any rate uh, uh so for those of you who may not know uh, where this subject is it's um it's kind of if you take orion and the shoulders of orion and it's almost it's about it's about shoulder width a little bit more um uh to the west of uh of orion here in monoceros and uh and this is the field of view that I'm getting in my telescope on my sensor. And, um, and so it also gives you a sense of the size of this subject. It's what, about the size of a full moon. So it's, it's really uh, quite, quite substantial. And uh, there's a lot going on in this region of the sky. And, and of course, the Orion Nebula here and the Horsehead Nebula and Rosette Nebula are just, you know, you could focus on, on this part of the sky all winter. And, um, I wish I could. Part of the problem is just below this area and where Sirius is, 
uh, right here is the top of a massive maple tree in my backyard. So anything, anything further south than this, I'm, I'm dead in the water unless I, unless I move to the front of my house or go to a dark sky site. So those are the kinds of things you have to live with here in the city. But, uh, you know, <laughs> further, furthering the discussion about where this is, if you haven't, if you haven't seen the 2016 book, picture this, I really recommend it. It's this great compendium uh, of comparisons and sort of showing where things are and how big things are relative to things we know. But uh, just to give you a sense, if you, for those of you who may not be film familiar, so there's there's the sun and the Rosette Nebula, and we're 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 in this Orion spur of of the um, of our galaxy, the the uh, the Milky Way. And you know we're talking about a very brief 5,200 light years away. I mean, we could almost uh, take that uh, astronaut training program and, and head out. Uh, there, there's some disadvantages though, which I'll mention in a minute that kind of discourage me from heading out there. But um, but being an archaeologist professionally, um, for, for me, time and space are things that uh, that have always informed my scholarship and. Um, when I look at this, when I look at something back in time, I think about what was going on on Earth 5,200 years ago when that light left the Rosette Nebula. What was going on? And we were the, the people on this planet were just uh, beginning to head into the Bronze Age. We we're just developing metallurgy, and and we were still about to develop cities and uh, and so forth. So uh, around this time is 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 really pivotal in in human history. It, it was a launching point for uh, where we are today, for better or for worse. So that's why I like to look at this. And, um, and then uh, with a plate solving of the Rosette Nebula, you get a real sense of how complicated this part of space is. And um, you can see in the, in the heart, kind of the bubble in the center of the nebula, there, there are a number of labels there. Um, and uh, one of the, a couple of the main labels there refer to a star cluster right in the center. And they're part of the engine of the Rosette Nebula. And, in this, and so you can see at the bottom of the screen that, that, that this, this is glowing. It's heated up to about 6 million degrees. So you've got ionized hydrogen and ionized oxygen all being energized by these stars in the center. They have been in turn created by the, this molecular cloud and the gravitational um, pull of, of, of the matter. And, and then in turn, this structure has been formed by, by the, the energy from those stars that are forming in this matter, plus the magnetic fields around here. So absolutely fascinating. And one of the things about all these different different names, like there's there are other names of of different parts of this uh, throughout this um, throughout this plate solved image, and that sort of speaks to the history of this. That um, it's been sort of pieced together over the last you know, few hundred years. So the the star cluster itself was identified in this in 1690 or something like that, and then other aspects of it we're seeing. We re really didn't get this full picture until long exposure photography came 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 to us and. So there's some fascinating publications in the astronomy literature about this that tried to look at it. I like to try to get a background on this, but it's for me as a as an archaeologist, it's it's tough sledding, but um, but I, I make an effort. And this is pointing out the main stars, and there, and this paper was about the 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 age of this interstellar bubble that that forms a central portion of of the um, of this structure. And then there's a recent paper, just a few years old, on um, on the complexities of how this how this Rosette Nebula formed, and um, and I'm not going to explain that. We don't have time, and I don't have the education either. But uh, the it's fascinating just how complex it is. The the interactions of the magnetic fields and gravity and stellar winds that produce this object, and they've they've done these um, computer simulations. To try to to say, okay, here are all the factors that we are aware of, and let's put them all together and see what the computer creates. And they're able to to model um, 
sort of best fits of these simulations to how this is actually formed. So I, uh, it's intrigued that not only we as, as, uh, as amateur astronomers are fascinated by this, but it's an important research topic in the astronomy world, so fascinating. This is my little bubble uh, here in um, here in downtown Mississauga, so Winston Churchill 403 area, and um, and uh, gives I can perform concerts from this if you if you want, but uh, I charge more for that. I charge more, but um, the but it provides me you know it's great. It provides me some shelter, and not only that, if there's a couple of hours that you can you can duck out and do some photography, all I have to do is is um, is make sure that um, that things are 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 set up, and I go back in the house and run this uh, remotely. And really, the main thing is just to open the dome and to get the open half pointing in the right direction. So I have some fun with that. But I have to say, and many of you probably experienced this when I first pointed my telescope last year at um, at the Rosette Nebula. <laughs> this is what I saw, and uh, I mean, I wasn't expecting a lot, but this was definitely a downer. Um, and 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 if it wasn't for the star charts, I wouldn't have realized that my my um, my telescope had slewed to precisely where it ought to be because this was the pattern of that um, of the star cluster in the center of the Rosette Nebula that you wanted to see. And if you, if you strain your eyes, I mean, I can sort of see it. There's some red pixels around around this, but for the most part, it was knowing that I had this in the center of the field of view that I figured I was on track. And then after after I started taking uh, three minute uh, images, three minute subs, and you begin to see that the nebula is showing up and then uh, taking them all at, back to my um, computer in, in the house where I began to process all these after stacking and calibrating, uh, this, is what I, this is what I got, which to some extent was a tiny bit disappointing because of all the gradients and so forth. And I, and, uh, but, um, I just simply decided to pay the big bucks for PixInsight. And, um, and I, you know, six months ago, uh, you wouldn't have caught me near the program. I, it was just so obscure and obtuse and dense and like a human hadn't created it. But I just decided that since so many people use it and that they're having great success with it, then Maybe I could too. So I began to study it and took workshops on it. And I have to say, I'm 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 a convert. Um, I, I I highly recommend the software because, uh, in the end, this is what I was able to pull out in PixInsight, and um, and uh, it has an incredibly nuanced way of working. And so you have a particular problem, there's a particular process or tool for it, which I, I really love. But that's another story. So there's my equipment on the left. And the images I'm showing you today were done with a, uh, were taken with a, with a, um, what's called a, a, a dual band filter, uh, a filter that, um, so I'm using a color camera. So I'm, oh, I didn't list it there. So for everyone who'd like to know, it's the ASI 2600. So it has a, an APS-C sensor. So it's an absolutely astounding camera and a, an exquisite sensor. I just love it. And, um, and, uh, and Steve Malia has been a, a great help in, in sorting out my technological needs. I mean, absolutely amazing. And I really appreciate the, the help, Steve. Um, and, uh, and so the ASI 2600 is a great camera. It's color. And Steve and I chatted about this, whether I ought to go mono or color. And, and frankly, the, the, I mean, he gave me a reality check. And the reality check that I really now appreciate is the fact that, you know, we all know this winter that the, the observation times are few and far between. And when you get them, you don't know how long they're going to last. Um, and tonight, I mean, before I came up here, it's a relatively clear night, but the winds are gusting up to 50 kilometers an hour. I mean, I got to pick something with the, in, 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 in sort of downwind so that my dome can block the, the wind and then I might be able to get something, but it, it's really crazy out there. So I did find about four nights in February between the 17th and the 21st to just start accumulating time on this. I got 185 three minute uh, subs shots for this. But what you can see then, because I decided to go to the color 
end of things. I'm not using all these separate filters to get different wavelengths of light. I'm using this one filter. And as you can see, it's, it's able to pull out the high, the ox, the, um, the, the um, ionized oxygen and the ionized hydrogen right here. And so you can, you can actually work on those two. And the top image is just simply a na the, the natural result. And hydrogen, when it's energized, is relatively red. Um, oxygen, um, needing many more steps to ionize, it needs, so it's, it's many steps away chemically from hydrogen. You have to create the oxygen. And as a result, it needs more energy to, to, um, to ionize. And as a result, it's closer to the hotter center of this, of, this, um, of this nebula. So in here, it's much hotter. So this is where you tend to get the, the oxygen, which is a, a bluish. It's probably exaggerated here, but a lot of the blue will be oxygen closer to this area. And then you'll get um, less and less oxygen as you go further away from the center. So that, those are the kinds of things that you can see. And just as my last slide, so here's here's where I where I went with this. I take all my my images, the 185 subs, as they're called, um, uh, and um, and then you stack them, calibrate them, and so forth. And so I, I took that other picture that I showed you and then created this one. So this has been calibrated. I've, I've got the gradient out of it. I've tried to get adjust the colors using the photometric calibration or these auto color routines that you have in Pixin Sight. You dial down the noise, uh, as uh, Ron Brecher and others call it, and work, work on the detail. And then you have this fundamental image that you do before you really stretch it and lighten it up. So this is, this is not permanently uh, lightened up and stretched. This is just temporarily so you can see what's going on. And then, then you permanently work on, on that and then have fun with the art. And, tune it the way you like it. And so I liked it a little in the, in the pinker tones. So that's where I went with it. So that was the one image. But using exactly the same data, I could get that other image. And what I did and, and um, the, uh, it, it is, is split the image into its R, G, and B components. And, and what you can see is the red has a lot of the hydrogen. You can see that, that the outer regions have much more detail and they're brighter. And, and these two channels tend to be the, the, the greens and blues would be the oxygen. And these are pretty much identical. But you can see that, that the, this pair and this one are slightly different. And, and then you use that and, and then you recombine them in, in whatever sort of soup recipe you care to. And you do that with pixel math and you can write equations and play with it and pull this together in, a, in, a, in another artistic form that has different meaning for you. And you can make this in different colors. You can emphasize this in different ways. And this is where the art comes in, where I really enjoy, I thoroughly enjoy these final steps and fine tuning this to get, get it the way you want it. And, and so as a final comment, I mean, I doubt that you'll see a, a shot of the Rosette Nebula online that looks the same as somebody else's. I mean, it's just it's really fascinating uh, to, to get these results. So anyway, that's my uh, endeavor. And I use, I actually use this to learn PixInsight and, um, and just had a, had a great time uh, pulling, pulling these images together. Well, thank you very, very much, Gary. Those are, uh... Those are awesome pictures, but it's really interesting to see someone uh, walk through it quickly, but walk through the sort of the process uh, to get to get those images. Those are uh, pretty nice. And I, I was I spoke with Gary briefly before the call, saying that uh, I was privileged to receive all the incoming uh, uh, submissions and saw some really nice pictures that we're about to see. So uh, um, I look forward to everyone having a chance to see some. Uh, see some further beautiful images. Thank, thanks Thank very you. much, Gary. Did uh, anyone have, the, there are just a whole bunch of comments, Gary, that's saying beautiful photos, astounding. <laughs> uh, but if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourselves. Otherwise, we'll uh, and I guess, you know, just we'll as one last on. comment, I really have to, I mean, not 
I just have to sort of give a shout out and a thank you to to how generous so many people are out there. I mean, strangers that that you just don't know um, who who provide advice and put together videos on YouTube about how to do these kinds of things. And uh, I, I'm just in some ways during this pandemic, I, I have. I mean, I would have found a way to survive, but I got to tell you that 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 this hobby and and the people involved in this hobby have been absolutely extraordinary and supportive, and uh, I'm just so glad to now be part of the community. Well, you've uh, made great strides, Gary. Well, I don't know what your work was like before, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, those are pretty nice images. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to now call on, I assume Leslie is going to do the, the whatever, yes, <laughs> Leslie, there we are, yeah, the thing, President, President, well, I didn't know whether it was you or, or Chris or whoever. I'll explain that. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> there is a committee of which I'm only one part. Chris Maliki and John Gola are the other two parts. And we're the ones that received these 53 um, pictures from 12 different actual entrants. And before we go on and show them to you, and, and we're going to, I have the screen and they are also going to talk. Um, so we're, we're splitting the talking part of the, of the show. But I just wanted to explain a little bit about how the, the contest runs for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, so that maybe you'll think about putting some pictures in for next year. Um, there are basically two parts of, of the contest. There's the general part and there's the master class part. And as you've just listened to Gary explain, there's an awful lot of work and practice and learning that goes on to produce the kinds of magnificent pictures that he's doing. And people that have won an award in the general class move up to the master class because we really felt that it was very difficult. It, it's, it's not an easy hobby to get into astrophotography. And if you're starting out um, it's very hard to compete against the people that have had three and four years who are really, really good at it and have used um, the opportunity to, to watch the videos and the advice and et cetera. So that's why we split it into the two categories. Now, we judge it, uh, the pictures, and we do not know who has taken the pictures, okay? We make Alan remove the names. And so that we are just getting data, if you want. And we judge it on three different things. Um, we judge them technically, which means we're looking for, you know, how sharp they are. Are the stars round? Um, what kind of noise is there? Is the color even in the object? Is the color of the background even? And, and it's a little bit different for nightscape where you have land, but for deep sky, that's the basic stuff. And then we look artistically, like is the composition good? Are there leading lines? Is the picture balanced? Um, is the color realistic? Is the, you know, is it new? Is it something different? Or is it the same old, same old that we've seen before? And how much detail is in the picture? And then the last one is just, we call it the wow factor. And it's personally, I judge it first. I go through all of them and it's just like, oh my gosh, that's good. Oh, I like that. Mm, maybe not so much, right? So that's, that's what we call the wow. So the technical is worth 30%, the artistic is worth 30% and the wow is worth 40%. So we, we crunch the numbers and we come up with the um, winners. Now, this year we have honorable mentions or those that came in third place. We have second place positions and we have the winners in, there were seven categories that we have, four in the general class and three in the master class. So if anybody has any questions, now would be the time before I go into, we sh start showing the pictures. No? Everyone's okay. Everybody is ready to go for next year. 
Okay, I'm going to share my screen. All right. Why are you not doing this for me? Your iPhone, iPad via AirPlay and via cable and which is not my stuff at all. All right, I'm gonna try again to share this. Yes, we now see pictures only. So. Double click on that, presumably. Slideshow. No, I wanted to actually start a slideshow. You see that? Yes, begin slideshow. Yes. Yay. Each guy general. That's, that's what it. Each guy general. Yes. Man. Success. Okay. Oh. John, go on. Where are you? Okay. I'm right here. Do we have everybody back first? Uh, 45, it looks like. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to move on to the, the, so this is the deep sky general category and we're presenting it in the order of honorable mention, second place, and then first place. Okay, okay. so ready, ready, John? I'm ready. So Deep Sky General, we had 11 uh, submissions. They were all wonderful. And uh, as Leslie said, it was just a real pleasure going through all the pictures uh, many times to score them and just appreciate the beauty. And uh, tonight our honorable mention is the double cluster in Perseus. And we love this. Uh, technically, it scored very high. The, uh, the framing, the color, the pinpoint stars in the corners. Um, what we liked about the framing is, is that the cluster there was just, if, it would, if, you're, if you were closer in, it would be hard to distinguish it. If you were further out, it wouldn't have the beautiful detail. So, so we love the framing. Uh, the background stars are excellent and the background is, is a nice deep black. And the, uh, the person who took this picture uh, you're already very familiar with because he just talked about astrophotography. So it's Gary Crawford. So congratulations, Gary. And we can go on to number two, the second place picture. Leslie's asleep. There we go. There we go. Oh, there it is. And uh, this is the owl cluster. I'd like to say too, that the top three pictures, actually the top four pictures all scored very closely together. And uh, so when you're, when you're looking at these and thinking why, uh, why was I second and not first or third and not second, it's just, uh, in this case, we'll say it doesn't matter, but uh, the, uh, the pictures were so close. It's really, you know, it, it'll end up coming down more into the uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So the wow factor for somebody like me versus someone like Leslie, who's a very experienced astrophotographer, whereas my photography is more of the uh, earth type. <laughs> anyway, the owl cluster, again, Beautiful, sharp stars right to the corners. Uh, when it came to artistic, you, you gain, a, he gained a little bit here with the, uh, with the crosses on the stars for effect, but then, you know, you might lose a little bit on the realism side of things, but it 
uh, it did add to the wow factor. Again, the color, you can, you can see the difference in some orangey reddish stars in the picture. So that was excellent. So scored beautifully on, on uh, technical, focus is excellent and artistic. We really enjoyed it. Uh, not to sound too repetitive, but congratulations, Gary Crawford for this wonderful picture. And now for the winner in the Deep Sky General. And I think people will be very glad that Gary will be in the master class next year. <laughs> we'll go on to the winning picture. Oh, back one, Leslie. Back one. Sorry. Leslie. Yeah. And it's the Wizard yeah. Nebula. Sorry. Here we have a uh, a black and white photo. Again, technically, everything was excellent. Again, pinpoint stars right to the corner of the image. Nice focus. And uh, the, the black and white uh, just adds artistically. It makes you dream of seeing it like that through your telescope eyepiece. And the, it also adds to the contrast. When it's black and white, you get more contrast and there's beautiful dark lanes in the image. And uh, that really brought, brought them out. So, and, and the wow, you think color makes more of a wow, but in this case, the black and white made for, for quite a wow. Beautiful contrast and really makes you think you're looking through the eyepiece of your telescope. And so the winner here, Still sounding very boring, Mr. Gary Crawford. So congratulations, Gary. All three were excellent. I would be interested to, uh, to know in Gary's own mind which of these three he liked the best. That, that is a very good question. Um, I, I actually do think I like this one the best and my owl cluster, I, I probably second best. I'm trying to, trying to put a twinkle in the owl's eye <laughs> a little bit with that one. And, uh, but I, I, I do love this one and I've uh, spent a lot of time on, uh, on the wizard and just blown away, just blown away by the, I, and, you know, it just sucks you in. Just loved it. Well, really all of those submissions were excellent and all the other submissions were also excellent. It, it's really, it's hard to make the decisions because, you know, we're talking really fine differences between all, all the photos. Thank you very much, Gary. I want to interject very briefly here, guys, and say that I put Gary on before the presentation because I, I knew he had made a lot of uh, uh, entrance into the, into the contest, but I was not aware of the outcome. And I wanted to make sure he had a chance to show his stuff before, just in case he didn't make it through. Mind you, I had seen them and I was pretty sure he was going to win something, but that's great. Thank you. Okay, the next You're category good. is Nightscape General. And this was also, it had just as many entries as the Deep Sky. These were the two uh, largest categories of entrance. And our, uh, our first picture, is oh this would also win for the best barn picture but it's uh, <laughs> the beautiful great it's not a great barn beautiful great conjunction of jupiter and saturn and uh, again scored very highly uh technically uh color the uh the lighting behind the barn of course the focus on the barn and you can see in to the left-hand side, the Jupiter and Saturn conjunction there. We love the framing, the lighting, and I would say the color. Those were the things that really stood out in this picture. And this is the honorable mention and congratulations, Kirby Alguire. That's a fantastic picture. I'm sure you, you recognize it and uh, 
Where was that taken, Kirby, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, I was taken uh, north, just north on, on Six Mile Road, uh, just up a, up a few uh, concessions. There's a barn on the left, and I was running short on time to get a shot before uh, the planet sunk into the murk, and so I just grabbed any old barn. <laughs> well, you grabbed a good one. Uh, thanks very much. The next one is another great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. Again, technically excellent, sharp focus, beautiful color. Along the artistic side in this picture was, it almost has uh, the look of a painting. The nice color palette just above the horizon as it blends in with the, the bluer sky. And then you've got the darker brown with even a bit of snow on the ground at the bottom. So excellent. It could be something that uh, one of the impressionists had, had painted and is hanging in, a, in the Louvre right now. The, uh, the, the, the framing, again, you, you see the, the uh, conjunction stands out more in this one than it did in the barn picture. And because uh, it, it highlights more in the top half of the picture. But the, the, again, framing and focus is just beautiful. So for second place, here we are getting repetitive. Congratulations, Kirby. <laughs> Beautiful photo. And now our winning photo. And I have to say, out of all the photos that were submitted, this scored the highest from all three of us. So we just love this photo. The impact of the thin crescent moon, the fact that we've got uh, Venus in there, with uh, the phase showing, just an excellent exposure and, and focus on that image. It's, of course, it's a Moon-Venus conjunction. The framing is beautiful with the trees. The, the coloring is, is great. The low clouds just below the conjunction, beautiful. And uh, it, you know, had the top wow factor for all three of us and uh, just excellent both technically and artistically and well what can you say to another three-time winner kirby fabulous congratulations on taking all three places in the uh, nightscape general category congratulations thank you you guys are too kind chris are you around <laughs> So smartphone pictures aren't <clears throat> very easy to take and have a good picture, but it's a new technology and people are getting better and better with smartphones. So uh, why don't we go to the third place uh, person? Uh, so do you want to show the next slide, Leslie? <clears throat> so third place. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> so third place is Milky Way. Um, we like the very numerous stars, like it just filled, like filled with stars. And you, then you've got the nice background, the, the dark lanes, the, the darkness and the right upper part. Um, artistically, it looks very nice. It's, um, you've got much of it on the left side and you've got the darker part on the right. So um, that looked um, nice to the judges and uh, yeah, the, and a lot of detail, as I mentioned. So the third place winner is Joe Vandenduel. I, I don't think he's here, but um, Joe won this one. So we can go to the, this is the second place picture. <clears throat> one reason why we scored high on this one is because of the beautiful earth shine and like the old moon and the new moon's arms. This is, um, <clears throat> this picture is um, Spica Moon uh, Merc. Oh, hold on, sorry. Yeah, Moon, Venus, Mercury, and Spica. <clears throat> so I mentioned the moon that, that we like the colors that you've got the deepening, um, um, the, the light blue at the bottom and gets very darker as you get to the top. 
you've got that little sign just in the lower right. So artistically, it's it was nicely done. <clears throat> and so the second place winner for this one is Bavishia Vignesh. I don't think, um, I didn't see that name here. So again, um, it's an absentee here, but that was the winner of this one. <clears throat> and now we could go to the first place winner, um, the almost full moon. Uh, this is a, one thing that struck us with a smartphone is how much detail you get at the terminator of the moon. Look at the um, six to nine o'clock position and all those craters and mountains that really stood out. And for a smartphone, that's very good. Also, the coloration was good. You can see in the um, Maria, um, like Maris Serenitatis, um, at the top, you've got different coloration of the lava. And that's what the moon really looks like. So we really like the, the color of this. <clears throat> so this was the first place winner. And the winner is Anika Garriok. Um, she's not here either, as, as far as I know. So at least we have three. Uh, actually, different... Anika is here, Chris. Oh, Anika is she? Is here. Oh, is she? Yeah, she is. Oh, uh, she's just turned 13. She's a 12. Oh, she cool. took it when she was 12. Yeah, this is Swapna speaking. It's my daughter. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, um, she, uh, do you want to see? A, do you want her to see a comment about this image, Swapna? Okay, that's okay. It's it's an option. Anyways, she's the winner. Anyways, she's the winner. Okay, so um, next category is solar system um, general. Um, <clears throat> this wasn't easy to pick winners on this one. We had a lot of arguing back and forth, but eventually we just had to add up all the points and that told us who won, who won which place. So let's go to the third place. Uh, so we had a lot of comment Neo Y. So third place is this one. Um, nicely framed, very well focused, and it beautifully shows the iron tail and the dust tail and dust tail becomes a very diaphanous as you go down uh, like towards a six o'clock position. So that was beautiful and, you've, and the colors are different in both of the tails. And the background was nicely done. As I mentioned, it's in focus. So this, so this third place was Kirby um, El, 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 Guire, El Guire. So congratulations. And now we'll go to the second place one. I think this one won because of the, the colors. You've got Mars um, at the upper left and Mars is red in here, it's the red planet. And look at all the colors of the moon. It was, it was enhanced, but again, you could see in the Maria that the, the lava fields have different colors depending on what the minerals they are. So this, I think this is one reason why this one scored so high for it. It's also very well resolved. The Terminator is beautifully done. It's nicely spaced. And this one was Gary Crawford, second place. Congratulations. And this is the first place, the, the winner. Uh, uh, sunspots, uh, prominences, you know, much a more detailed picture on the right than on the left, like a higher magnification on the right than on the left. Really good detail and resolution. Um, the colors are the way you would expect the sun to, to look. Um, on the left image, you could see um, uh, towards the limb of the sun, you get that limb darkening. That came out very well. So the colors were very, very beautifully done. Winner of this one was Gary Crawford. Congratulations. So at least uh, there's one person won two of these and one person won another one. So congratulations to both of you. And I get to do the master class. Which um, just, just quickly, there was a, a question, what filter was used on the solar image? Gary? 
Yeah, that was the, um, um, it was a hydrogen alpha filter. I'm using the, um, oh, <laughs> my mind is going. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. You 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 can you can post it when on the uh, on the group side sure, on channel, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Gary, <laughs> Gary, Steve, maybe, yeah, maybe I can help. It was it was a Daystar quark. Yeah, they, the Daystar quark, and um, and and this was done with my 115 millimeter uh, refractor as well, um, and a and a and a monochrome a 174 uh, an ASI 174 camera. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And and uh, Rob Neal is is uh, reminding me that uh, following this, all of the entries will be posted to the website with a description of the of the uh, processing that took place and the equipment that was used, and obviously the uh, the um, the artist that uh, or astrophotographer that took the images. Okay, moving on to Deep Sky Master Class. Um, these are the people that I said that have won before. Um, and um, we had an awful lot, of, we had a lot of good pictures in all the categories and it wasn't easy making the choices. Um, we, we did it individually and then we met to discuss and, and basically it was really quite um, surprising that we kind of came to the same three. We weren't always on the same order, but we were the same three in every category. So this one was the honorable mention is the Tulip Nebula. It's something you don't often see uh, done. And um, it had really, you can see the actual tulip kind of shape in there. The stars are nice and round. Um, background is a good color. And um, it's kind of nicely balanced with the, the stars on there. You have a lot of black on the right hand side and you have those stars showing up a little, uh, as against the lighter ones on the left hand side. So that was Dennis Gasparato who took that beautiful picture. Then the um, second place, um, was a beautiful M16, the um, Eagle Nebula, which we've seen many, many times, but it's always beautiful every single time. This one has um, well-defined the, um, the dark areas in the nebula are nicely defined. The stars are, you know, very nicely done. They're not too bright, they're not too big. So they, they kind of take a bit of a second, um, second class, I guess, to the actual nebula itself. So it's just, and it's very nicely positioned in the um, frame with the diagonal line from the lower left to the upper right, which is always good from a compensational point of view. So um, that was second place. And that goes to Dennis Gasparato. And moving on then to the third one is the uh, Wizard Nebula again. And it's uh, not in HA this time, but in color. And um, this is actually one of my very favorites. And um, it, it's just got a nice shape to it. It's um, kind of flowing nicely. You can see that the ridges are um, quite sharp and defined. And um, it just looks, I don't know if it really looks like a wizard or not, but it's got other names. And, um, but I think the wizard probably is the most descriptive of the item. This is another object that's not taken that often. You know, it's, it's not like Andromeda, which everybody tries to take. So it's nice to see that. And the winner again, Dennis Gasparato. So another sweep of that area. Congratulations. Uh, there are lovely, lovely pictures. And then we had um, our Nightscape Masterclass. We had only one entry in this area. So this uh, takes first place. And it is the beautiful picture that Shaquille Anwar has taken of the comet coming down with the ion tail and just coming down and then reflected in the water below. 
Um, it's just one of those, wow, you know, it, it strikes you that way. And it's not, not common. I mean, it's a very different depiction of the comet just because of the reflections. So um, stars nicely done in top half and uh, the comet is just, you know, it's taking center stage as it well should. So congratulations, Shaquille, that's lovely. And then the solar system master class. Um, here we had some, some different um, pictures that showed up and different uh, takes on things. And this was our third class, our third honorable mention, which is called Tatooine. I think that's how you pronounce it. So it's the moon and the crescent Venus. And what we really liked here is, is Venus really can be seen as a crescent. It's not overblown. So you can actually see that crescent shape and it's a perfect um, shape and in, in the right direction to just fit with the crescent of the moon. Like it, it couldn't have been lined up better, I don't think. So that was definitely our third choice. In second place, Oops, no. In our second place, Who's this is a Jupiter and Saturn conjunction. And this was- um, Leslie, I have to announce who, who, won the, who won the third oh, place. Yeah, third place. Oh, sorry. I mean, yeah, third place, there we go. Third place was Shaquille. Shaquille for his, his tattoo. I am sorry there. And then this one is a Jupiter and Saturn um, conjunction. It's um, a um, composite picture taken with uh, different shutter speeds in order to get the moons in there very nicely. But you can see the bands in Jupiter, you can see the four moons, you can see Saturn and a couple of, of its moons. And so that is really, really nice. And the person that took that again is Shaquille. So congratulations again, lovely. And then the very last one in this category, again, a Shaquille picture is this magnificent comment. We were so lucky to have that this summer. And this is just a beautiful, beautiful picture of it with a. You can even see, I think, a little bit of the green and the head there and the ion tail is, is colorful and very, very visible and stars are very nice and, uh, you know, sharp in there. So again, congratulations, Shaquille, and another sweep of that area. So that's great. Thank you all. The pictures were great and I really would encourage people um, 2021, hopefully we can get out a bit more into some darker skies maybe and um, just try and take some photographs and, and just have some fun out there. And um, there's so many beautiful things in the sky to take and you can do it from your smartphone or from your camera on a tracker as some of these were done or through a, a, you know, a telescope and just get out there and have some fun. And I'm looking forward to the, all of the submissions next year. Thank you all, everybody who did um, submit them. Um, all the pictures were good. We had, um, I say, uh, spent a lot of time actually going through and looking at them and, um, you know, looking at um, what worked, what maybe didn't work quite so well, but that's all part of the growing and the learning. So um, thank you all again. Well, thank you very much to the uh, our three judges. Uh, I'll also point out for people who are feeling intimidated that remember that the winners from this year go on to the master class. So you're not competing against these guys that have produced such marvels this year. So you're you're lucky in that regard. And and maybe someday we'll go through everyone and then we'll have to recycle or something. <laughs> that would be uh, nice, Alan. That would be great. Yeah. Hey, we should be so lucky. Um, I would like now to call on Ron McNaught. He has a talk on, well, you can describe it, Ron, take it away. Hello. Yeah, we hear you. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. What I 
have is um, there are features that the Perseverance rover might find on Mars um, that could be indicative of life. And I'm just wondering, given the time and the delays, if I should just do it next month and with luck or non-luck, uh, Perseverance won't discover this and then it will be new then. And if it's not, I'll give you a context, a context to what's, uh, uh, what they found. Uh, by all means, we, we've now run over. So um, um, perhaps what we'll do, I, I know that um, the discussion on um, um, the uh, astronomy logbook software, uh, Krishna, is that something that you would like to run through just because our next potpourri will be a month from now? Or is it something that can be delayed for a month? Can do you think you can go through it in in about ten minutes or fifteen? Yeah, I think I can do it in ten minutes. It should be fine. Okay, if, if people don't mind staying on, um, it is um, it is some software you can give a try, and it, it looks fairly interesting. So let's give it a go. <clears throat> Hello. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Krishna, go ahead. Yes, so I'm sharing it now. Can you okay. guys see the screen? Hello? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, so, uh, so the, I was having some trouble observing uh, and noting my observations when, uh, when we're in a dark sky area and uh, there's, there's no light, I have to carry my notebooks, logbooks, papers, whatnot, and maintaining all of that in, the, in a better way, storing them in a better way. And then when I want to go back and review them, it, it's, always a, it's always a problem, it's always a trouble. So I was thinking, is there any better way to do this kind of uh, 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 note, noting down my observations in, in, uh, in an electronic format that I can easily retrieve back whenever I want to, search through them, um, and things like that. And that was the genesis of, uh, of this astronomy logbook app that I created. Um, so I'll skip through some of these slides that I was meaning to go through, but essentially that was the gist of it. Um, so the, the requirements that I set for myself was the app, um, it should be friendly. It should, uh, it should store, the, store my logs in a, in, a, in a modern database system that should be secure. Um, that should be only accessible by myself or whoever the user is. <clears throat> it should be searchable. It should be accessible on any of my devices. I do have a Mac, a computer, a couple of cell phones, the uh, tablets, iPads. So it should be accessible on all of them. And it should be easy for people to be able to add new features to it or remove some features from it, things like that. Um, and the, the, what I decided while developing it and when the idea came was that um, I wanted to keep it as an open source software. That is the software is uh, anybody in the world can look at the actual code of the software and be able to modify it. So you can come, if you're a programmer, you can compile it for yourself and use it. That way you don't have to worry about who is using your data, who, who has access to your data. It will be entirely up to you. But if you do want, uh, I did release the app on um, on <clears throat> on the web, on a website and Android um, Android um, uh, as well, so that it, that can be usable. What I'll do now is I'll quickly run through um, through the web implementation of it. It is the same whether you access it, access the logbook on a website or on an Android or iOS. The, I'll give you the links where you can download the app on, uh, in, the, in the next slides. So let me go ahead and share uh, what the app looks like quickly here. Can you guys see, see my screen? It's a browser now. You're browsing as a guest, yeah. Yes. Okay, so <clears throat> it is uh, astrolog.vedala.holdings. It is, uh, as you can see, it is a secured, it's a secured site. And the login is just one click login. Um, you can access by Google account, by Apple account or with Facebook. There's no sign up process for this per se, but, um, <clears throat> okay. And 
it will immediately take you to, to the sign, signed up page. So in the logbook, it has multiple tabs. It is just this one screen. And in this one screen, you can scroll through all the logs that you have ever recorded. You can continue adding logs by pressing the add log button. It will, <clears throat> if you have access to, to GPS, if, the, if you're on a phone, it will automatically retrieve um, the, the GPS coordinates from the cell phone and populate them here. If, if, you're sorry, on smartphone, if, if I can interrupt for a second, your screen isn't being shared. All we can see is the PowerPoint slide. Actually, it's, oh, the fir it's the first screen that I'm seeing. I have two screens in the, in the screen that the screen that I normally see the gallery on. That's the one that he's presenting on, actually. So, but for people that don't have two screens, I guess they wouldn't be able to see that. So, okay. can you switch Fine. your screens? I think uh, I think is what you need to do. Uh, yeah, that's uh, better. Okay, yeah, exactly. Perfect. Sorry about that, gentlemen. Um, so, so uh, let me go back. So this is the login screen. Once we log in, this shows you um, the list of all the observations that were recorded. Um, you can add a new observation by clicking the add button and uh, it, will, it will retrieve the GPS coordinates from your smartphone or your computer and populate them here. You can enter the address, select the equipment that you're using to note down your observation. Um, <clears throat> let's say uh, Orion Nebula, M42. You can skip the NGC part if you do not want to add it. Um, here I'll say, so that date of observation, I'll mark it as today. Let's see, and 9.15 PM. OK. I'll set visibility and transparency. And we can add a few notes. In the, uh, um, <clears throat> can barely make out, out the net velocity, for example. Accept, and when I, when I click Submit, the data immediately goes into the cloud and gets stored. Now, the same thing can be accessed anywhere on the planet, whether you are accessing the information from your smartphone, um, it will show up there immediately as well. If you want to take a look at your observation, you can click on it and we'll have the full details. You can add uh, more notes to it if you want to make some edits. You can click on a note, make the edits there. Um, if you want to delete the observation and boom, it's gone. Um, <clears throat> and then you can also filter your observation based on date range. Let's say observations made between the first and the 12th and it will filter that for you. If not, you're back to normal again. The, um, the one thing that I wanted to add before, before I did this presentation was selecting a couple of these observations and exporting them into a PDF file that I can immediately share with, um, with anybody that I want. And if I click the share button, or I can print them out. Um, and this has all the details that you, would, that you already have, your name on it, um, the, data, the sky conditions, notes, everything that you have made the observations on. Um, that was one. The, a, <clears throat> then you have the you have another filter, selected items, items that are not selected. Um, adding equipment. This is the equipment tab. You can have multiple equipments that you might be using. Um, so I have two of them, both are both using the Skywatcher HQ5 mount, but one with a normal camera lens, the other one is an uh, is an actual telescope. Um, the, this is a feature that I was I implemented for personal use, which is when I go to observation, I have a whole lot of things that I carry with me. And in the nighttime, when I put, pull them all out, I want to make sure that I do collect them back. So that is my checklist item. So I can have all the checklist here, um, save it. And then when I go, when, I, when I'm done with it, I can uncheck them all and say, yes, I have retrieved all my items back. So that way I don't forget anything that I've left out there uh, in the wild. <clears throat> this is to be implemented. This, I, I, I wanted to implement something for astrophotography mode, um, but uh, so that, that is the app. And you can log out if you want to, or you can just leave it and it will continue to, um, continue to stay logged in on your phone. Having said that, I'll get back to my, uh, to my uh, slide share and stop this one. So that was the, <clears throat> so this is the observation slide. 
um, adding and removing equipments, observations, checklist items, PDF and the PDF export. Um, so the whole thing is available, the entire code is available for free at, at this link, um, the website. You can access the same data from uh, uh, using, using the website or the Android or on the iOS. Now, the iOS part, I do. I did realize that I would have to be a, uh, I would have to subscribe, I have to pay a subscription fee to Apple to distribute the app. And since it is a free, unless I find a patron, I did not want to do that. So, um, so what I did was, uh, so this one would be removed. So the iOS, you can compile it and you can, you can install it on your own, but we were, I would not be distributing that as of now. Um, but uh, the, so the cost of the app is completely free. You can compile, build it. The, the only caveat that I have from my side when I'm distributing it for others is that I'm using Google Firebase in the backend as a, um, <clears throat> just as a database system and to do the logging to ensure the authentication and all the protocols. So, so that has pricing associated with it. And currently until, um, until I reach a certain limit, it's all free. But after that, it will be, it will be charged. And I, if I don't charge it, then the, if I don't pay for it, then the access to it will be limited. However, the data still exists and persists safely on the cloud. So if you want it, you can always return it back. The future for this is the, the one thing that I recently uh, realized was that adding a sketch interface to this would be important because a lot of people are trying to make sketches of the observations that are being done. So, so these are the future items for this. Um, thank you so much for, for spending five minutes to look at, to listen about the app. Uh, and that's a special thanks to Robert Neal for being the first person to validate it for me and uh, giving his valuable re reviews and insights. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for uh, buzzing through it a little faster than you wanted to, but it, it uh, I thought it would be important to get the, uh, the word out about it uh, so that more people could give it a try. That's, that, is, uh, that looks really cool. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank all of our presenters tonight and I'd like to thank Ron for stepping aside. I also uh, um, will put off my uh, talk about uh, Telescope Loan Program. Y'all know it's up on the website anyway. And look for the um, astrophoto uh, astrophotographs, all of them with all the details and everything to be posted to the website in the next little while. We'll send out a note when it's available on the website. Uh, and also, uh, if you missed any of this because of our technical issues, by all means, look up on the YouTube site, well, on our website that has a pointer to YouTube uh, so that you can uh, watch any part of this uh, uh, meeting uh, offline. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and uh, throw it open to any questions in case there are any last minute questions. I didn't see any uh, obvious ones that uh, people typed in, but speak up now if, if you have any questions. I, I miss you people. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I see the beginning and the end now. I, I got my first COVID shot today. So the end is in sight. So, hey. Okay, well, thanks everyone. And have a great weekend. Have a nice weekend, Bye now. guys. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye, Lucas. Bye. Thanks. Have a great weekend. Have, have a nice weekend, yep. everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.